Okay, so our revels are going to continue before they're over at the end of these two hours. Uh, since we are a somewhat smaller group than usual, probably because of the holidays, I wonder if I can persuade the people who are sitting on this side to come and join us over here. If it's not too much trouble, I think it would be more communal if we could, and probably easier for Larry and Mel to do the 50-yard dash with their... Uh, good. I should have done this long ago, don't you think? Thank you all very much. So again, just to remind you of what our sequence is, uh, today we're going to talk about The Tempest. On the 2nd of January, right after the break, there will be a plenary discussion where you're supposed to come with questions and protests and suggestions and thoughts and preoccupations, uh, and they'll also will, that will segue seamlessly into a kind of review for the exam. And the exam will be the following week, is that right? So, on the ninth, in this very space. Yes. So. 5.30 and 7.30. And don't forget the papers are due at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For folks who are coming in late, we're going to try to organize ourselves in smaller space, please, because we're a smaller group today. So I would be grateful. Larry, maybe I can station you at the door and you can kind of steer people just, just so we can get rolling would be great. Thank you very much. So, The Tempest, um, conventionally regarded as, you know, Shakespeare's last play, his farewell to the stage, as you know if you have read my chapter, which I hope you have, um, it is none of these things. We're, we're going to try to, sir, we're going to try to move everybody into the, into the middle here. For, yeah, actually, into the, actually, really, actually into the middle, yes, yes. Um, Right, if you want an end seat, whoa, careful. Uh, we, can, we can put you over here. Uh, if you've read my chapter, then you will know that uh, this is not true, that uh, Shakespeare and his company produced at least one more single authored play, uh, Henry VIII, or All is True, uh, that there are other plays that Shakespeare is, seems clearly to have collaborated in producing. Uh, he doesn't retire from the stage at the moment when this play is finished. Uh, his death comes several years later in 1616. Uh, and in fact, what we have in this notion that the play itself is Shakespeare's farewell to the stage is a kind of cultural fantasy that we have produced because we cannot bear to lose him. And so we would like him to be able to say goodbye to us. Uh, nonetheless, there is some goodbye saying and some hello saying in this important play, this really uh, crucial and extremely powerful play, uh, a, a play that, that, that is full of recognitions, refindings, startings anew, uh, and confrontations with mortality, not only the mortality of the protagonist, Prospero, but also the notion of figures outside the play who have died, the fantasy that Ferdinand's father has died. Uh, the play is full of intimations of both mortality and immortality, uh, and it handles these things with extraordinary grace and beauty. Uh, this is uh, justifiably and uh, uh, consistently one of Shakespeare's most admired plays. It's certainly a play that I very greatly admire myself. Uh, it's a play that has gone through many different strong periods of interpretation. And one of the things that I think that we should do in talking about this play is to review for ourselves the modes of interpretation that have seized upon the play and made it their own. And I will also want for us to look at some of the particular passages in the play that are so, again, justifiably moving and beautiful and celebrated and quoted out of context, whether it's by T.S. Eliot in the Wasteland or, or uh, in very, uh, various other places. Uh, and we'll also want to look at the major characters in the play, because what, what after the, the other three romances that we have looked at, uh, which had a, a vast 
uh, landscape, the moving from place to place to place, a uh, huge time span with two of them having in the middle of them a space of 14 years and 16 years, many characters, armies, nationalities, uh, personalities uh, flowing through these plays. And here I'm speaking again about Pericles, Cymbeline, and The Winter's Tale. Here we have a play that's extremely compact in its personnel, very compact in its location, very compact even in its time span. Uh, what's happened in this play to the, uh, the, the, the growing up gap that we noticed in the, the other romances, the necessity for the second generation to grow up, what's happened to it here? Yeah. Happened before the play begins. We saw that in Cymbeline, uh, but we, we nonetheless, Cymbeline was full of, of you know, losses that took place in real time, so to speak. Here the losses, most of them, although not Ferdinand's supposed loss, have already taken place. What's the time span? Uh, 12 years. 12 years. Does that mean that Miranda is 12? How do we know that? She was three. Splendid. Okay, very good. So she is in the Juliet young marriageable age. She is a, a, a young woman uh, who has never really, almost never known anything. She has a dim memory of where she came from. Uh, but she is uh, one of the few, as she thinks of it, uh, inhabitants of this island. Maybe let's set the personae first, and then we can talk about the effects of the play. So um, the, there was, the, the play begins in Medias Race, so to speak. Something happened 12 years ago that we're going to find out about in retrospect by a conversation. Uh, who's, who's Who's in the play? I was going to say who's on the island, but who's in the play? Who are the characters whom we will encounter? Yes? On the island, now you have Prospero, you have his daughter Miranda, you have Caliban, and you have Ariel, right. the non-human. <laughs> Not only non-human, but how, to how many of these characters is Ariel directly available? Who Prospero. Sees him? Prospero. Yeah. Prospero. So, so that, that Ariel is a, I mean, we see him, or her. Uh, there was a long tradition at the end of the 19th century in which Ariel is played by a woman. Uh, I've seen productions in which Ariel is played by a male gymnast. It's an acrobatic role. Uh, it's a dancing part. It's a, but, but, but not everybody encounters Ariel directly. Prospero does and the audience does. And that tells you something about the angle of incidence into the play, the degree to which we are you know, part of the Prospero world, Ariel indeed. Uh, and so, so and, and these are the, the current inhabitants of the island. Who has lived on the island previously? Sycorax, and who is Sycorax? Caliban's mother. What does she look like? Sorry? How do you know? They tell us that she's ugly, but I don't remember the language. The foul witch Sycorax, who with age and envy was bent into a hoop, the blue-eyed hag, uh, says who? Prospero. Uh, so, so one thing to, I mean, it's not that I'm telling you that Sycorax was actually, you know, a movie star, but, 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 the, but we, uh, this is hearsay. This is all reported information. Uh, and Sycorax, as, as, as it's important to keep underscoring, is outside the boundary of the play. Uh, she's, she is the dispossessed former occupant of the island. She's female rather than male. She um, is also a witch, the way Prospero is, a witch or a ma magician or a sorcerer. But she does not get to speak for herself. She's outside the boundaries of the play, and the degree to which she is demonized or described in these negative terms uh, is, uh, this is the language of, dare we say it, the conqueror or the dispossessor or the successor or the winner. Uh, this is how the people who have replaced her on the island uh, describe her. We don't have any contrary information. Caliban doesn't say, oh, but she was beautiful. We don't, it's, not, it's not that, but we do have a, an interested population that describes her as unfit in various ways, or malevolent in, in various ways. Well, do we know anything about any actions that she performed while, she, while we had her? Yes? She imprisoned, Ariel. she imprisoned Ariel inside a tree. Aha. Uh -huh. What kind of tree? I don't remember. 
a pine tree, pine tree. I mean, not that it matters, but or maybe it does. But but uh, in, inside a pine tree, why? We know why. Anybody know what? We learn what? Speculations as to why. He also was able to do magic and, in some sense, compete with her. Well, he's a he's a he's a, he's a sprite. He's a spirit. He's we we he it, she it. Uh, uh, so we could say that you know that, that there's a if we wanted to allegorize it. We could say that this is a life denying or it's a controlling situation. It's hard to say. Um, Thank you. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, so, so, uh, Sycorax imprisons Ariel in the pine tree. Uh, is that worse than what Prospero does? similar in that she imprisoned him and Prospero has enslaved him. And it's the same amount of time. It's 12 years. Right. Uh, now, enslaved is a tough word. Uh, is it used in the play? It's, who uses it? Um, well, Ariel uses it. Um, several people use it at different times. But um, he, Prospero calls Caliban his slave. Caliban, yes. Right. And so there's there's... And then, but Ariel's always begging for his freedom, so he's right. enslaved in, in his There's own There's an way. analogy to be drawn here, but I don't remember, maybe other people will correct me, I don't remember that the word slave is used with respect to, yes, Ariel. Ariel re repeatedly refers to Prospero as master. As master, yes, indeed. Indeed, but but there, I mean, for example, there's a master among the shipmen. There's a you know there's a bosun master. Uh, you could be the master with a servant rather than a master with a slave. You could be a master with a mistress. There be many different ways of being a master without being a slave master per se. Certainly, Prospero controls him, employs him. He con consistently asks for his freedom. There is a tremendous analogy between that and Caliban's request for freedom. But I don't remember in the text that the, play, the word slave is used. Servant, yes, exactly, servant. Now, this, you may think that this is a dis distinction without a difference. You may think that this is just, you know, uh, we like Ariel better than we like Caliban, or Prospero likes Ariel better than he likes Caliban, and so the word is used differentially. Uh, nonetheless, the tasks that, that, that Ariel gets to perform are different from the tasks that Caliban gets to perform. What kinds of tasks does Ariel perform? Enchantments, okay. Um, like what? <clears throat> He's the one that causes the ship to be tossed at sea. Crosses he separates okay. all the characters so that none of them know each other is alive. Right. And he also um, causes the entire crew of the ship to be enchanted for the duration right. of the story. Right. Yes. And more. then at various other points, he causes characters to be, fall asleep. I to believe. fall asleep, right. that's right, mm -hmm. to be, uh, at one point, Ferdinand is frozen in his tracks, can't, he's enchanted, he cannot move, the banquet with the several st strange shapes entering, bringing a banquet, the music, the island that's full of music, that's so remarkable to Caliban, one of the most beautiful passages in the play. This is Ariel's music. Ariel is the musician, he is playing the music. So, music, what elements do we associate with, with, with Ariel? What ele yeah. uh, Air. What are the four elements? Remind me. Earth, water, fire, and air. Uh, so air, fire, aerial. Earth, water, Caliban. Too simple, yes. But this is a very elemental play. This is a play that 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 is so sophisticated and so sure of itself that it can mobilize all of these great Renaissance cliches and all these great Renaissance. Uh, uh, set texts and set pieces and make them do something very special. It's a, it's a remarkable play. The, the economy of this play, the brilliance of this play, the way in which it boils things down to things that are very elemental is what has given rise, among other things, to the sets of interpretations that we'll talk about in a second. So, so Ariel and Caliban, there's an analogy and a disjunction between them. Uh, Caliban 
also enslaved, abhorred slave, always? This is history on the island? No, why? Yes, please. He was um, nurtured um, by um, Prospero until he tried to rape Miranda. How do we know? Um, they tell us. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> again, again. No reason to doubt it. Oh ho, oh ho, would it have been done? Would I people the isle with Calibans? There's certainly a sense that he, you know, he doesn't deny it. Uh, but, but again, the accusation, or rather the description of what took place. This is like date rape, you know, that he said, she said. I mean, the, the, the description of this as a violent act, as an unwanted act, as an, as a, as a, uh, an act that deserved punishment and that deserved to uh, move him from the state of playmate and favored second child into this enslaved state in which, what, is, what kind of work is he doing now? Menial work. He's uh, there's wood, wood enough within. He's carrying the wood. Uh, he's uh, what else does he do? Brings the water. Yeah, he he's, he he is supplying the necessities of life. He helps um, them survive. Yes, um, but it's almost as if his act was amoral. Um, it, it when you hear him talk about it, it it's he's not even um, apologetic. Um, it's almost as if he was meant to do that and he didn't know what else, how else to be. Well, and indeed, we hear something about his education, don't we? I mean, who, who has his princ been his principal source of education? Prospero. Prospero. And what has Prospero taught him? Um, through his books, um, to, to be taught civilized. Him astronomy, to how to name the bigger light and how the less. Uh, taught him language. Taught him, and and and, but but Caliban himself did a little teaching. He's the naturalist. Here are the berries. Here's the, the the fresh isles and the fertile water and so forth. That there's a kind of exchange that goes on. Uh, and but but while while uh, Prospero is busy doing you know big science, so to speak, he's not doing the sex ed lecture. He's not. There's no sense in which he is uh, training Caliban up to be himself, to be. Uh, a, a, a suitor, a gentleman. courtier, a gentleman, a gentleman, exactly. Think about, about the Winter's Tale and about that wonderful moment when they decide, they, 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 the, the shepherd and the clown are given titles and money and the clown says, see, I'm now a gentleman born. Because the phrase gentleman born is one phrase to him. He doesn't understand that gentleman and gentleman born are two different things. Uh, so uh, the, the Caliban, who actually is a queen's son, uh, is not brought up uh, as the inheritor of the isle, but rather as somebody who is taught certain sets of things, but not other kinds of things. But he is taught language, uh, and that becomes crucial. Um, and uh, what is it, in, in his own estimation, what's the effect of his having been taught language? You taught me language, and my profit on it is? I know how to curse. I know how to curse. Why? Is that because of his nature? That's what Prospero says, or, and, and Miranda too, uh, one on whose nature, nurture, could never stick. Is he just bad? He's just bad? Bad seed? Figure of evil? Please. From his perspective, wouldn't it be that he's been put to hard labor and doing all this menial work and being treated as a slave? which is enough reason to curse those who impose those conditions on him. Was, yes, and behind you, please. Yeah, that also, um, love was withdrawn from him. He was loved right. at first and right. then no longer. Right, right. Uh, this is partly a sort of tale of adolescence, too. I mean, if, if you, uh, there are many, many ways of allegorizing this play and many ways of appropriating it into our own time as allegorization. If you ask historians of the Renaissance, they will tell you there's no such thing as adolescence uh, in the Renaissance. Indeed, if you remember, again, the very wise shepherd in The Winter's Tale, who says, I wish there were no time in life between you know, a certain age and 23, because all the time in between is just fighting and, 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 and disputation and so forth. That's the sort of little adolescent moment described, that if you think of, of the shepherd as the sort of the Dr. Phil of, of, of The Winter's Tale, that, that, that in this case, uh, we have a Caliban who, again, off stage, and we don't quite see it because we, we don't have that sense that they're in that same moment, um, has, has reached this point of rebellious adolescence um, and behaves against the father surrogate. Yes, please. It's also, I think, worth noting it's a 
stage of adolescence that begins with his awakening sexuality when right. he first right. attempts to. Right. And indeed, this is often the case in the plays that we have looked at and the plays that, that, that are in the first half of, of, of the Shakespeare's career as well, that what causes a sundering between parent and child is the awakening of desire, uh, whether it's Juliet's preference for Romeo over the county Paris or, or Rosalind falling in love with Orlando in As You Like It. Uh, in all of these plays of adolescence, and there are many of them, or, or indeed Ferdinand, it's not Ferd, Ferdinand, Florizel and Perdita falling in love with one another, and as they think, uh, going against the wishes of the father, uh, the father Polixenes, who only you know, comes back into the fold when he discovers this is actually a, a princess and not a shepherdess. Uh, but these, these rebellions uh, are almost always moments of sundering from the parental bond and a going out into the world uh, and the beginning of another kind of narrative. And indeed, in this case, it is very unvarnished. It clearly is sexual desire. It's not. Uh, Caliban uh, doesn't. Uh, I mean, again, the figure probably we should compare him to is Clotin in, in Cymbeline, where, where again, it's a kind of a desire mechanism that Clotin causes beautiful music to be sung. Caliban is a consumer of beautiful music. He likes the twangling of instruments, that sound he, that, that he can't identify because he can't see Ariel. Uh, but in fact, the story that we are told of the offstage, again, negative event that took place between or upon with Caliban and Miranda is a violent event, not a courtship. It's not that he brought her flowers. It's not that he wrote poems to her, that he, he, you did you know, uh, attempt the chastity, the, 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 to violate the honor of my child, is what Prospero says. Again, he's an interested father. He, I, 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 so I don't, it's not that I want to sow doubt in your minds about what actually happened. I just want to remind you that these are off-stage events, that the story of Sycorax is an off-stage event, the story of the attempted rape of Cal by Caliban of Miranda is an off-stage event. What else is an off-stage event in this play? <coughs> Excuse me. What else happens off-stage, either before the play begins or around, like, in the surround? The usurpation of Prospero's kingdom by his brother. Indeed. Indeed, and, and uh, this, this happens before the time space, time, time <coughs> span of the play begins, and it often hap also happens in a different place. Where? Milan. In Milan, yes, which, which is pronounced Milan in this play just because of the, the scansion in Milan. Yes. Um, <coughs> yes, please. Arabelle's marriage. Ah, but yes, well, well, I want to talk about that, but let's, let's, let's stay with the the usurpation too. No, that's crucial and I, that was actually what I was thinking of but let's just hang on to that for a second and go back to the usurpation of the dukedom just to flesh it out a little bit. Uh, why does, uh, who, who, who usurps the dukedom from Prospero? Antonio. And Antonio is his brother, right. Um, is he wrong to do so? Prospero <coughs> wasn't governing. He was into his magic into the magic. Right. His, his, he prefers his books. He neglects the governance of the state, that he is in his study instead. Uh, the opportunity presents itself for usurpation. Again, it's not as if everybody says, oh, it's great, you know, really much better to have Antonio ruling. But Prospero is like King Lear, unburdened, crawling toward death, like that he is ignoring the issue of state. And he's wrapped in secret studies. He's enraptured by the study of magic. And magic in, in this period encompasses a very wide range of things. It is not only doing tricks or playing tricks. It, it, magic, science, and religion are terms that are very much imbricated in one another in this period, the evolution of the notion of science uh, develops from the notion of magic, of natural theology, of understanding how the world works, of commanding. By, because Again, if you don't understand how uh, the wind works, you could think that a sailboat is magic. That, 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 so that it's partly a matter of 
who understands and who doesn't understand how natural forces work, and who understands and doesn't understand how math works and how language works. Um, out of this period will come a practice that will come to be called science, a word that literally means knowledge or knowing, uh, and out of this, and, and will come a kind of rationalization of science and a certain kind of notion of science as a set of practices. But in this period, these categories are very fluid. It is until quite a long time after this, for example, that alchemy is thought of as distinct from chemistry. Alchemy is the immediate parent of chemistry, and in this period, not distinct from it. So that when we hear that Prospero is a magician, I think we, we, we need to have that, or that he, he deals with secret studies. I think that we need to have the broadest possible picture of what that means, that this is not uh, merely uh, the kind of thing that we see Ariel performing on the island with the, the disappearing banquet and so forth. Uh, that the, 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 the study is really the study of how to control the universe and how to understand the universe. And this is both noble and dangerous. Uh, and, it's, and, and, and it's also extremely preoccupying. Uh, it's preoccupying to the extent that he neglects then the affairs of state and his brother Antonio usurps the dukedom. Uh, how does he get rid of Prospero? Sets him adrift. In a little leaky boat with a leaky little daughter, right? Okay, so, so we, the, the, a cherubim thou wast that did preserve me. That's, I think, what the text says. Because uh, she says, of course, that, now again, remember the completely artificial exposition at the beginning of this play. Uh, they have been together on this island for 12 years. Now, maybe he never told her this story before. Uh, uh, because why? She didn't need to know it before. Because something's about to change. We, again, the play begins in Medias Race. The, there's, there, there's the shipwreck. And again, it, have many of you have seen this play in the theater? It's fabulous the way this play begins because be you're in the middle of this storm and the shipwreck and you hear the clanging and, and it's, uh, the people are shouting and things are very distinct, uh, indistinct, sorry, and hierarchy is gone. I mean, this whole, remember the, again, the scene in, in, the, uh, in the Winter's Tale when the clown is on the shore watching the shipwreck and he's talking about the shipwreck and the poor souls and so forth and he's also watching the Antigonus being torn apart by the bear and how the, the uh, Antigonus cried out he, that his name was Antigonus a nobleman but the bear paid no attention to the fact that he was a nobleman and ate him anyway. Uh, this, now we're in the middle of that shipwreck so to speak and again there's no distinction of, of class or rank. Everybody is in the same boat literally uh, and everybody is in the same storm. And who, in fact, is in that storm that is coming toward the island? Who has been ensnared in this storm that Ariel has made happen at Prospero's command? Sorry? Who? No, it's, 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 it's all these Neapolitan and Melanesian uh, dignitaries who are part of the Prospero story. Um, the Prospero story of the past and also the Prospero story of the future because we get not only uh, Antonio the brother but Alonso the king of Naples and his son Ferdinand the prince of Naples and there's a plot in view. Uh, this is the good suitor as opposed to the bad suitor and pretty soon we'll find a third suitor arrives on the island to make this even more explicit. So, so the uh, the, the, the offstage uh, is this, this action which precipitates where we are right now. That it, that it, it, I mean, there's a sense in which this island that Prospero is on is just or entirely his own mind. That, that, that's, that's where he withdrew. That's where he went. He went into his study, the place with his books. He went into the, the, his mind and into the notion of the elements and how he could control them and so forth. And there's a sense in which he, he, he has journeyed or been shipwrecked on a place that is the equivalent of that psychic space that he was in before. Uh, it's a place of possibility. It's a place of elemental distinctions uh, in which those elements that he might in his magic place be playing with are uh, 
personalized by Ariel and by Caliban. Uh, it's, we could say that it's a laboratory. We could say that it's a place of experimentation. We could say that it's a place in which both human and material or elemental experiments will take place. Uh, uh, but historically, uh, it's an island where? Where is this island? Why do you laugh? Because it's variously attributed to lots of different islands, even Jamaica. But it's most likely an island that's just north of Africa in the Mediterranean. And when you say most likely, for based the, upon... For the story. For, yeah, in, ter in terms <laughs> of what we know about where they're coming from and... Uh, yes, uh, okay, good. Over here, please. Well, we, they're, they're coming back from the, the wedding in Algiers. Yes. Which is <clears throat> referred to as Angier, I believe. Right, right. Ar Argier. 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 Right. And so uh -huh. presumably they're going back to Italy. So they're somewhere in the Mediterranean. Right. It seems, seems as if this is a Mediterranean island, but they, you know, this is a perpetual question for Shakespeareans who have you know, these large concepts to worry about. Is the play a new world play or an old world play? Is this island, because some of the flora and the fauna, the business about the still vexed Bermudis, the Bermuda Triangle, this is the Bermuda Triangle play. The play about sort of the ship that gets lost, the people that get lost, the things that are never heard of again because of this kind of magical set of vectors in the, 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 the atmosphere. Uh, there's a sense in which this apparently perfectly clear location is also perfectly unclear, that it, there are enough confusing clues thrown in here just to make you say, wait a second, wait a second, why are there Bermuda winds here near Algiers? And uh, you could say, you know, well, Shakespeare is not a naturalist. He doesn't know how to read maps. He's using two mixed sources or so forth. Or you could say this is inadvertent genius. This works spectacularly well to make this the quintessential island in the quintessential body of water, uh, uh, having to do with the quintessential set of enslaved or uh, incarcerated populations. Certainly, people, Europeans have often read this play as a play about Algeria or about, about the European-African relations. On the other hand, as you probably know, the play has been rewritten by uh, Latin American, South American, uh, Haitian, Martinican writers, uh, uh, New World playwrights and, and poets and essayists in the 20th century, in the late, late 19th century, to, as their story, as the story of their enslavement or their hopes or their, their necessity of them separating from North America or from white colonization or from, from, from England or from whatever, or from France, uh, whatever the colonizing power was thought to be. So that the, the, the uh, it seems to be clear, only it's not quite clear. And the not quite clearness, um, this was a topic, that, in fact, the Shakespeare Association of America, which is the annual conference of Shakespeareans, always takes place in a kind of nice and interesting place. Several years ago, I think you go to this meeting, took place in Bermuda. And so at, on a completely horrible rainy we weekend in Bermuda in February, and I kept saying to the president of the Shakespeare Association, who was a friend of mine that year, uh, at, at, I said to her, you know, it rains in Bermuda. And oh, no, it'll be great, it'll be great in Bermuda. So there we all were in a hotel in Bermuda, raining like that. Um, and well, it did clear the next day. But, but the, so that one of the topics of this particular uh, meeting of the Shakespeare Association was, is The Tempest a new world play or an old world play? To which the answer is yes. Um, and there, there are vigorous proponents of both, and for the reasons that you guys have mentioned, absolutely, that's one kind of argument. There's another. Depends upon what you want it to mean, kind of. It depends upon what you want to use it for. It depends upon what, what, the, uh, what story you think it's ultimately telling or what story your audience is, is receiving. But, but so, so indeed, 12 years ago, in another place, there was the usurpation. In other words, Prospero for all that he is deeply aggrieved and has been used ill, there's some, as with King Lear, uh, shouldn't give away your kingdom. Shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, shouldn't stop being king before you have to, so also Prospero here again. Shouldn't neglect the affairs of state if you want to stay duke, which maybe you don't. Uh, and 
again, if you know the whole wide scope of Shakespeare plays, you'll know that they're often two brothers, Hamlet, uh, old Hamlet and Claudius. Uh, the, as you like it, Duke Senior and Duke Frederick. Think of some others, think of some other cases in which there are, there are two fathers, so to speak, rather than one. Think of any, any more of these? There are lots of them. Um, and, and, and here, too, we have, it's, it's, a, it's as if the character splits in half. It's as if you have the, 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 the Duke who, who deals only with affairs of state, and is rather Machiavellian about it, and the Duke who is of higher mind but also uh, not paying a lot of attention to affairs of state. Uh, and that's the, that's the part of Prospero, so to speak, that comes to the island. So now, sorry, did you more on this? Sorry. Please. I thought more of Measure for Measure than King Lear as a reference for this Ah, play. abdication of, yes, that's a very good example. It's a very good example the, that the old fantastical Duke of Dark Corners, that, this, that the Duke begins by saying something is rotten in the state of Vienna and I can't fix it because it's partly my fault. I have let the, the laws grow lax and so I can't myself enforce them. I'm going to have my substitute Angelo do so. Now whether that turned out just to be a ruse in order to test Angelo or not, hard to say. But precisely, something, some, some basically virtuous person in, a, and it, very, very similar, that there's some sense in which, what was his set of preoccupations? What was he doing instead? you have any instinct about this at all? Yes, please. Well, he would, the, the Duke was sort of running around and manipulating things behind the scenes and moving the characters around, which is kind of similar to what Prospero winds up doing. That's what he does, yes, in the play, absolutely. That, the, that, that, that this notion that this Duke is a playwright or that Prospero is a playwright, that, that he's, uh, that's actually absolutely what happens in the course of the play. Do you have any instinct about why, what before, before the play begins, so to speak, what he was doing instead of running the government well? Partying, you think? Uh, he he says, you know, the dribbling dart of love, dribbing dart of love will never pierce this complete bosom. He's not interested in love and sex, even though he actually is interested in love and sex. So we don't have, I think, the sense that he's a party boy particularly. Anything I, else? I think it's, it wasn't he just preoccupied with being too kind, and things got out of hand because he couldn't bring himself to enforce the laws. There, he's too mild. So it's it's, not, it's he's not that he actually did anything. He just let things go. Hard to say. He's more. I mean, if you imagine you know, the, the Hamlet of the early scenes of Hamlet as the king, rather than to, that. There, there's some sense in which he thinks too much. Whatever. He's not obeying the laws. And and one of the things that dukes often do in Shakespeare plays that have dukes in them is to first lay down the law and later mitigate the law. They often come out at the end of the play, as happens in Measure for Measure, as happens in Comedy Veras, and says, well, you know, don't worry, I, I pardon you, you can have mercy rather than the law, and so forth. So that the Duke is often in that position of first being the person who has to enforce and lay down the law and impersonate the law, uh, mortality and mercy in Vienna, uh, and also the one who can change it. This is certainly exactly what happens in Measure for Measure. Here, too, uh, we have a Duke who has some choices to make. Uh, Clarabelle. Tell me about Clarabelle, please. Clarabelle was Alonzo's daughter, and she, uh, she is <laughs> forced into an arranged marriage that she really doesn't want to. Why, and why doesn't she want to marry whoever it is she's marrying? Well, I think the, he was black. He's an African. African. He's an African. Yeah. And she, she didn't want to go there. And I think that, the, I don't know whether I'm just intuiting this, she didn't want to give up the power in uh, Naples as well. I don't know that we know that. I mean, this only comes in in this question of who is the, you know, the king is, the, the, the <laughs> king is dead. So who is the next heir of Naples, Clarabelle? Right. Uh, at, but she, you know, she'll never hear that her father's dead because right. she's miles and miles and miles away. So if Ferdinand is dead, you know, as it's postulated or fantasized at one point by Alonzo, uh, theoretically she could uh, not take over the power and that it would go to Antonio. Maybe. Or to Sebastian. Yeah. Sebastian, Sebastian the, 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 again, the, the wicked brother right. of the king, of the king Alonzo. Um, so, so, so we, have, we have this family of... Uh, 
uh, Alonzo the king and his daughter Clarabelle and his son Ferdinand. Clarabelle, as you say, arranged marriage. Again, remember dynastic marriage, very common in this period. Father chooses the, the, the husband. Uh, all the women we have come to know, uh, who are they who resist this? Name me some of Shakespearean heroines. Who, yes. Sorry? Desdemona. Good choice here, since, since she actually chooses the, the, the black husband rather than the, a, 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 a darling of the city whom, he might, whom her father Brabantia might prefer. Who else? Imogen. 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 Great choice. Good. Okay. Uh, even um, the Cordelia. Uh, they won't marry Burgundy, King of France instead, and so forth. This doesn't turn on the choice of husband, but the choice of husband is related a little bit to this question of obeying the father and of the father's edict, where the, uh, uh, Burgundy changes his mind. You know, election makes not up on these conditions. I won't marry her if the, if the dowry isn't there, but also I won't marry her if she, her price is fallen. The father doesn't adore her any longer. Uh, King of France has a different set of values, let us say, and so he... He marries her, but so so this this business about the daughter submitting to the marriage edict of the father or the daughter choosing for herself. Again, we uh, we're told this. We're told this in a very vivid way about her resistance to this marriage. And I think you mentioned both reasons that the play gives us for it. One that he's an African and that he's other than she, and other also that it's very very far away. It's she's leaving Europe in order to make this marriage. And uh, nonetheless, they've all been to the wedding. So it's not as if they've hidden her away. It's not as if they, I mean, they, they, this is a kind of a, hello, arranged marriage, but it's one that's obviously sanctioned by, and, and this is where they're coming from. So we could say, you know, part of their problem is that the ship is burdened with, you know, bad vibes because of the, the, this forced marriage. Uh, but Clarabelle, indeed, is way out of the, the, the edge of the play. Uh, so uh, Clarabelle and Sycorax, again, are, are uh, different kinds of women from the woman that Miranda is. And Miranda is the only woman whom we see. How would you contrast uh, Miranda with Sycorax? How would you contrast Miranda with Clarabelle for Sycorax. Anybody compare them in the play? Well, the, the obvious well differences. I mean, everything that Sycorax is described as being Miranda is the opposite. Right. She's young, she's beautiful, she's innocent, she's, you know, she's, oh, brave new world. Right, uh, right. Uh, whereas, I, I would think if you were contrasting her with Clarabelle, you don't have the physical um, description, but you have the experiential kind of d difference, because Miranda has none of this experience of dynastic. I mean, she's about to be <laughs> made a dynastic marriage. She doesn't realize it. She doesn't realize but, it. That's right. <laughs> but um, she's that total, that totally innocent of not even having seen human beings before, except for her father and Caliban. Right. If you right. But you, you very well show both the, the disjunction and the conjunction here. That, uh, In a way, very same thing's about, about to happen to Miranda. Her father has arranged a suitable marriage for her. Uh, he has brought her together with the suitor. He's going to make sure they get married. But we see this production of uh, 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 what about, feigned resistance. The father pretends to not wish this in order to test or to create the climate for healthy disobedience or whatever it might be. Uh, that there, uh, have we seen this before in the romances? Have we seen a father pretend to resist the daughter's choice? <laughs> it is in Pericles, yes. Thais's father, great, great. What, you remember his name? Simonides, which is also the name of, of a great uh, Greek poet. Uh, that Simonides pretends to be angry at the daughter's choice and tells us that he's happy with this, but that he tests her by, by pretending to be displeased. We get a very much more fully fleshed out version of that in the pros parent, parent way in which Prospero feels or seems to feel toward Ferdinand. Uh, but, but Miranda, as you say, is a brave new world, innocent, has not, not brought up in the court, 
uh, doesn't have this sense either of parental constraint or of uh, what the, you know, bo both the, the dangers and the beauties of the court world. Uh, there's a sense in which she is a kind of natural innocent at the same time that she's a natural sophisticate. And when we first see her at the beginning of the play, uh, what is her role? What is her role vis-a-vis -vis her father? What is her role vis-a-vis -vis the shipwreck? Absolutely. If by your art, my dearest father, you have put the wild waves in this roar, allay them. Um, she, again, think about the scene that we saw last week with the clown standing on the shore and watching the shipwreck and having this kind of distanced account of it. And it's not that he and his father, the, the shepherd, don't feel uh, compassion, but yeah, it's way out of their control. Shipwreck is one of those things that happens in nature and all you can do is grieve and, and pray and move on to the next thing. In this case, however, what's the real story about this shipwreck? It's not a shipwreck. It's a piece of magic. Everybody's clothes are dry. Everybody's alive. Everybody, there, there's, there's a, it's a, um, it, it, it is so much like the real thing that we first encounter it as the real thing. We're in the dark, it's noisy, it's, we hear people shouting and so forth. We, we don't begin on the shore saying, watch this magic false uh, storm I'm going to create. We wind up in the middle of it and then we are disabused of its danger as she is. That we are part of that spectatorial moment with Miranda, whose name means what? Wonder. I mean, one Miranda. Uh, to be wondered at and to wonder at itself. Now, wonder, uh, a, a, again, a, a major, major category in the medieval period in the Renaissance. Uh, people collected uh, wonder objects in wonder cabinets. It's a, it's a, uh, the, the idea of the natural world and what it can do is full of these objects of wonder, and sometimes they're, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're amulets and wrought things, and sometimes they're things in nature like crystals, uh, but the, uh, and, and, and aberrants in nature too. You could say that, that Caliban is himself a kind of natural wonder in that he looks like a fish as well as like a man and so forth. That, that, that there's this, there isn't an attraction repulsion difference here. These are all wonders in a way. They're all kind of uh, cre uh, creations of nature. But Miranda, is both herself, oh, you wonder, says Ferdinand to her, and admired Miranda once he learns her name, so that we, it, it's underscored for us that he understands both that she is a wonder and that she is a wonderer. She's a great audience, uh, but she's not a wimp. She's not merely the good girl. And the fact that she's not merely the good girl is, is brought home to us by the fact that she is allowed to rebel against her father, that again, she keeps secrets from him, that the capacity for subterfuge, uh, which is a kind of Juliet-like skill uh, and an Imogen-like skill is also one that she is able to use. Uh, so that, 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 that she's not entirely passive, that her Femininity is not entirely a negation of action or power. She has her own mode of action and power. But she begins in the play as this wondering personage, uh, someone who is somehow conflated with the baby that she's described as having been and with the cherub or cherubim that he describes, the, 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 the infant angel that he describes her as being who lifted his spirits when he was set adrift into the boat. Uh, but she, she is, uh, and, and again, this is characteristic of the way this play is set up, that you've got one example rather than many of a certain type of thing with the other examples offstage uh, or not immediately available to us. So that Miranda's occupies the only onstage female role uh, but leads us to ask certain questions about the women who are around the edges of the play and what happens to them. Uh, uh, what about uh, uh, 
Prospero himself. We have held him a little bit at arm's length here in our description of the rest of the cast of characters. How would you characterize him? Yes? Well, doesn't, doesn't Prospero, in fact, control everything and everyone like a chess master? Mm -hmm. At the end, there's that chess game. And mm -hmm. It's almost as though, as the magician, chess, he is the master. He controls everybody. He, from the beginning, he, it seemed to be a plan. From the beginning, it seemed to be a plan, absolutely. And it turns out that even, for example, the courtship is a plan. That, that, that you, you know, what seems to be accidental or a fortuitous circumstance turns out to have been very carefully crafted. Is there any point at which, yes, go ahead, please. When he went into his books, it was as though he meant, he, he went into some different place which allowed him then to control um, reality. Is there a limit to his power? Would you say that there is a limit, and that is why he uh, takes the point of view at this point with his daughter's uh, emancipation coming, that he is being freed and he goes on to, uh, to grow himself in a new way? What's he going toward? He's going toward forgiveness of his brother and okay. of, of himself. Okay. Is this, this his own idea? Who suggests forgiveness to him in the play? Yes, please. Ariel uh, describes how he, he is moved, I think, to pity. Yes. And Prospero replies that um, he's almost ashamed that he doesn't have a strong reaction. Right. Dost thou who art but spirit, etc. And uh, am I, I mean, uh, uh, let me see if I can get the lines right, uh, where, where um, Ariel says, you know, mine would, sir, were I human, and uh, and Prospero says, and I, mine shall, but I, I will, in fact, uh, release. This is when they're, 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 he's describing the people in the stinking <coughs> mire, uh, and uh, the, the, the Ariel begins to have a sense of pity about this, that there's, there's this kind of transformation from, because the, uh, the, this play has the shape of a revenge drama. This is, this is a familiar genre in this period, uh, the long, nurtured uh, sense of hurt and injury, finally the culprit comes within your grasp and you're going to do everything you can to disconcert him and to have revenge upon him and to bring him low and even to kill him. And it's a revenge tragedy which, uh, in a different way, different way from Hamlet, but in a related way, averts itself here and becomes something else. Yes, please. Um, I was just curious um, about where Prospero's wife was. Uh -huh. um, and uh, the question earlier about what are the limits of his power, he can't make people love or not love. And I was just wondering about, for him, um, the meaning of the wife not being mentioned, I don't think, in the play. And Miranda's not curious about her mother. Right. Uh, is the wife ever mentioned? Um, if it was, I missed it. There's a, there's a, uh, right. Sir, are you not my father? And he replies, thy mother was a piece of virtue, and she said, thou wast my daughter. Right. right. <laughs> this is very characteristic. Now, remember, we just came out of Winter's Tale, where this, this issue of the undecidability of paternity, here, uh, it's often uh, a kind of, unpleasant witticism of this kind. The, the very same joke is made by uh, uh, Leonato in uh, uh, Much Ado About Nothing. This very same joke about the sort of the mother said and so, and, and it's kind of a boys and boys joke about this. Uh, this is a, so it's a proverbial kind of thing to say. It's, uh, it's coming to the common language. But here's the place in which the mother is mentioned in relation to dynastic succession. In, and, and authenticity and legitimacy. 
Then there's a moment quite late on in the play um, when Ferdinand is watching the mask. And, he, and this is a disputed crux about which there have been interesting things written, where he says, either, so rare a wondered father and a wise makes this place paradise, or so rare a wondered father and a wife makes this place paradise. The question is whether it's the long F, the, the long S, which is the, the, in, in Elizabethan printing or in ja Jacobean printing, uh, an S in the middle of a, of a line often has this long tail, or whether it's an F. And you can't really, t I mean, you can tell, but, but it's, there's been some dispute about, but, but in this case, he's talking about his own wife, of course, not about Prospero's wife, but it did give, give rise to a very interesting article by Stephen Orgel called Prospero's Wife about this que very question of the absent mother. And, the ab and, and of course, absent mothers, as we've noticed, ha are, are, are pretty present in these plays uh, that most people, except for, for, uh, for Coriolanus, has an absent, have an absent mother. And there's, there's almost always this sort of glance toward it. Uh, I, uh, what, what do you want to make of this? Do, do you want to interpret this? Um, um, I'm, I'm not uh, ready to. OK. Uh, it, but but what, one thing it does do is to make her rather like Perdita uh, in the little domestic world of the shepherd and the clown, the, uh, or indeed like um, Imogen in among Bellarius and Guiderius and Arvirigus, the only woman playing the role both of mother and of daughter or mother and of brother or whatever role that they, they think they're playing, uh, that the, the, the daughter, mother, wife role is, I mean, this is the other woman to Prospero. And indeed, there have been arguments, not mine, but there have been arguments that part of his resistance to other suitors is a kind of incest, a kind of a desire to keep her for himself. Before we laugh at that too much, we can remember the incest moment, that fleeting incest moment in Act 5 of The Winter's Tale, in which uh, Leontes mistakes his daughter for somebody that he could marry. Yes, please. How does it the idea of the limits of Prospero's power, it seems to me that, that it's, his power is, is conditional on, this, on the island. Yes. That you know, if he if he had unlimited power, he could just take off and go take Milan back anytime he wanted to. I mean, he has to make everybody come to him. Right. It just I, seems very interesting that kind of movement that everything has to come right to him. Again, the the question will. I mean, for my kind of reading of the play, since the island and Prospero are are versions of the same, that the space is a kind of imaginative the space of his mind in which all these things are happening. Uh, there's a certain kind of of logic to that. But, but in any case, he was certainly powerless in Milan. Somebody took his power right away from him, magic or no magic. His magic was not helpful in trying to keep his, his position in the world. So he was exiled. He didn't choose this. This was not a pleasure trip. This was not a Cunard liner that he was taking to this island where he then decided to stay. This was a, a place of exile, a place of rejection that he then made into something. Uh, and indeed, when he's going to go back to Europe, it is going to be at some cost. What's it going to cost him? Sorry? Giving up. giving up his magic? Giving up? Drowns his books, breaks his staff. Every third thought will be my grave. That, that he's going back into the world. Uh, it's as if he's had this moment of eternal life that is now turning back into the, you know, suddenly he's going to be an old man. And it's clear that his time is almost over that he's going back into time, he's going, that he's choosing death. It's not, it's, not it's, it's pathos, but it's not pathos. He's, he's going forward, but going forward means going into death rather than away from it. Uh, at this inopportune time, we'll have to stop and take a break. Uh, do come back to these yellow sands after these five minutes or 10 minute break. Okay, so let's, let's now take a moment to sort of look at the big picture issues that have marked various strong interpretations of this play before we then come down to look at some of its textural moments. Uh, and I, I mention this in part because, as I say, the, the, if the island is a kind of laboratory for Prospero, so also the play has become a kind of, of laboratory for various kinds of criticism. It has, has called forth very different very compelling, very persuasive modes of criticism. Maybe we can just name some of them to begin with. 
what would be various critical approaches to this play that you're familiar with? Okay, great. Let's, let's just list these to begin with, and we'll come back and talk about them. Okay, anything else? Yes? Uh, metafictional. Metafictional. Splendid. Okay, great. More. That's it? Okay, fine, let's talk about that. It's crucial. Well, there's the, the, the Prospero is Shakespeare, the kind ah, of okay. the play. Ah, okay, autobiographical, okay. Okay, anything else? Anything else? I would say that there is both, so to speak, a psychological and a psychoanalytic way of reading this play and that they are different from one another. Okay. And I think also, probably under colonial, we can put issues like the master-slave dialectic. But discourses of power, I think, and enslavement are, are things that we might, might want to talk about uh, slightly adjacent to rather than completely identified with the colonial discourse. Because the colonial discourse is, to a certain extent, a historical reading. And the, the, the Fanon's argument about this play, for example, or Manoni's argument about this play, uh, would be an argument that combines the psychological, the psychoanalytic, and the power argument to talk about how it is that people get themselves into these relationships of master and slave, or uh, how it is that this is a kind of consent agenda, so to speak, and what kind of a relationship this is. Uh, so, all right, this is a good start. We'll get rid of these F's and S's that are confusing us here. Um, the, the, sorry? Uh, this reminds me that there are also quite good feminist readings. Those with F Fs and Ss, remember, were part of the Prospero's Wife discourse, that there are quite good feminist readings of this play. Uh, and, and many others. That the play, as I say, is uh, because it, it's so perfect, it really uh, lends itself to many readings of this kind. Uh, pick one out, and let's talk about it for a second. Psychological. Okay. So, um, how would we distinguish the psychological from the psychoanalytic, just in very, very broad brush terms? Do I feel I must defer to the expert in the room? Uh, anybody have a view about this? Stroke would be one would be um, psychoanalytic would be more unconscious forces as opposed to conscious. Sure, okay, so I mean, uh, bearing in mind that th these are not absolutes, but so that, that psychoanalytic would have to do with, with, with unconscious motivations or the motivations that were somehow uh, not perfectly understood by or even maybe aggressively misunderstood by the people who were performing them. Uh, there, there are psychoanalytic ways of reading texts and psychoanalytic ways of reading characters. Uh, psychology of a, again, this is very, no psychologist will agree with me about this, but when we talk about psychological readings of plays, we're to a certain extent talking about character and motivation and the relationships among characters and uh, uh, the family clusters and, and, and things like that. And a psychological reading of this play then would participate in the conversation that we had a little while ago about the uh, father-daughter tensions, about the sexuality causing a, 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 an imperfect conversation between them and uh, deceit or dissimulation, the competition between the, the father and the suitor, uh, the, uh, the absent mother and what this might suggest about the extra roles that are heaped upon Miranda, the, uh, and, and, and the discussion that we had about Caliban too and whether, whether you can talk about Caliban having a psychology whether he has a persona uh, that where he has motivations, he has desires, he has relationships. 
so that, for example, a very, very famous, beautiful passage in which he talks about music, which the be not a fear, the aisle is full of noises, uh, sounds, and sweet airs that, that, that uh, give delight and hurt not. Uh, that, that this, this is a kind of childlike utterance of kind of, uh, it, 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 that gives you an insight into an aspect of Caliban that seems quite different from the, 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 the figure of Caliban that you see in front of you. And this figure of Caliban is itself performed in many different ways, sometimes as a kind of hybrid monster, sometimes as a uh, native resident of an island in uh, woven clothing. Uh, but the, the question is sort of what, it, what, it, what is the interiority of Caliban like? What is the interiority of, of Prospero like? Uh, what are the motivations of these characters, uh, and what's the extent to which, if there is one, uh, that there are more than one father, more than one child in this play, that, there, that there's, there's a kind of splitting out of uh, the, the, the typical roles, of the typical 20th, 21st century roles of generational relationships. Uh, the, let's, uh, the colonial story here in, uh, is, is, as you probably know from reading the footnotes in whatever text you're using, embedded a little bit in the history of the time in which the play was written. Remember again that we're always going to pay attention to the time which it's written, the time which it's set, the time which it's performed. Uh, and in this case, uh, even though it's not a history play per se, those three things have coincided in the late 20th century to remind people that decolonialization, that colonization were preoccupations in uh, the Elizabethan and early Jacobean period and also, of course, in the last half of the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century. And that, uh, that the, uh, the, the journeys of Columbus, the journeys of, of uh, uh, Strachey, the journeys of, of, of various, Captain John Smith, that very, various of these journeys of exploration that seemed to find a paradise and then uh, the, maybe a disease came and destroyed the, 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 the sailor population or uh, they, they were marooned and they, they either found that it was magical and then found their way back to, to, to England. Uh, that, that these stories that, are, that, that, that seem to be part of the subtextual history of this play are stories that new historicist critics were very interested to find actually reflected and rewritten uh, or and in some kind of conversation with what was going on in these reports of uh, exploration and conquest in the period. Uh, exploration and conquest, which remember is part of a kind of nationalist project. It's part of an, it's the rising capitalism. It's the beginning of a kind of triangular trade in goods and slaves, um, and in which so-called civilization is exported and so-called nature is imported and people are part of what's brought back and so forth. But it's also nation building. I mean, all these terms that came back to haunt us ourselves in recent history. It's also a notion of sort of the, wh whether this place belongs to us or to the people who live on it but don't deserve to have it because they don't understand it the way we do or whatever it is. So that the, 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 the allegorization of the colonial moment is multiply written into this play. And the degree to which the play is, so to speak, about Caliban has been at the center of this question about the, the degree to which the play is colonial. I had a colleague uh, when I first came to Harvard, when I was, I, I came here as a, as a tenured professor, but I was quite young, and I had a very senior colleague uh, who had been teaching this play for years, and who was very startled by the then rising tide of colonialist readings of the play, which again then for 15 years became the most common way to read the play. And he said to me one day, he said, if Caliban were the hero of the play, I don't know what the play would mean. And for him this was completely destabilizing to imagine uh, recentering the play around Caliban and what he had lost and what he might get back. I also saw a production of this play that I believe was directed by Mark Lamos, the same guy who did the Cymbeline in New York in, at, at the Hartford Stage Company Theater, um, in which Caliban at the end of the play, <clears throat> remember that, that there's much, much stage business about Prospero's magic garment, lie there my art, the art of what thou art, the question of the, 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 the magic garment that, that 
is his, part of his, his magician's apparatus that he will abandon at the end as he uh, drowns his book and breaks his staff and so forth. And in this production, the magic garment lay on the stage, on the island, and Caliban picked it up and wrapped himself in it and began to dance around. And you could see that the whole cycle might be about to repeat itself again. That what Caliban had learned was how to be a colonizer. That what he had learned was how to be a master, how to seek revenge, how to be a figure of power. That in this particular production, what had happened to Caliban was not, I'll be wise hereafter and seek for grace, not this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine, not this notion of the somehow conversion of Caliban along the way, but in fact a Caliban who stood apart from any uh, uh, reunion at the end of the play, much as Autolycus stands apart from such a reunion at the end of The Winter's Tale, and decides he's going to be himself, but now he's learned how. And that he, he picked up the magic garment and put it on was in this production a sign of repetition rather than of the end of that repetition. It was the things had not been redeemed. They, maybe they're all the rest of them going back, but here was Caliban uh, about to, to, to show what he had learned. You know, he learned language, he learned how to curse, uh, he learned astronomy and so forth. Now he learned politics. Now he'd learned, learned colonial politics, he'd learned dictatorship, he'd learned mastery. So this would be one, one way of making your way through the material of the play. Um, the uh, humanist, I'm so glad you mentioned the notion of a humanist reading of the play. What would a humanist reading of the play be? First of all, what is humanism? Yes, go ahead, please. If you've got an answer to question one, we don't need question two. Let's, um, I, might, I might be simplifying it a little, but it sort of Prospero learns the true meaning of Christmas, I guess. You know, he... Uh -huh. <laughs> Ah, I see, I see, yeah. Well, that's, the, no, the, the, that's, that's an applied notion of humanism, that, that he becomes humanized. Uh, the humanism in this period is, among other things, a kind of, of educational movement in the Elizabethan Jacobean period. It's something that is fueled by Italian philosophy, and basically what it does is to put man rather than God at the center of the universe. That the, the, uh, the Hamlet's famous speech about what a piece of work of man is man and so forth, which is an echo of Pico della Mirandola's oration on the dignity of man, one of the great humanist documents, uh, is, a, is a text that wants, it's not that they forget about God, but they're, you know, when you hear people uh, shaking their hands and their fingers these days and saying secular humanism, this is what they mean. That they, the idea is that, that man supersedes God or religion. In this case, it's a restructuring of this image, there's still the idea of, man, of, of God and of the beasts and so forth, but that man, a little lower than the angels here, assumes a more powerful role. And this, this role was often emblematized on the, theater, on, the, on the stage by the figure of the actor, who again was in, in, in the, the, the Globe Theater situation between the heavens above and the hell below, as the names of these parts of the theater were described and so forth, that, that this is a very man-centered, human-centered art form. And there's, this, there's a way in which uh, Prospero, precisely because he doesn't know everything, he doesn't have infinite power only in this one space, he is going to die, he does lose things, he does need to be corrected by Ariel. Uh, he does need Miranda's support as a cherubim and so forth, that he is man in the old-fashioned sense of mankind. Uh, he's also a man, and this, this split, now we're going to take a very short but important little, little uh, detour into deconstruction. You'll have your five minutes of deconstruction. That, that uh, man as the substantive that means all human beings is, uh, is a word that stands by itself. Uh, when you break man into man-woman or man-animal or any other binary in which man is only half of something. So we say man-woman, man-animal, man-god, man-beast. Uh, th then, uh, then man becomes not the whole thing, but something in relationship to either the, 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 the primary partner or the secondary partner. God, man, man, woman, uh, you can tell who's, who's in charge here, so to speak. But, but Prospero at various points of this play is man, and at Prospero at, at various points he is man in a binary relation 
Um, and this is structuralism, not deconstruction. But, but uh, what deconstruction will do is to sort of talk about how that word man then gets emptied out of meaning once it, once it gets broken, so to speak. Once it, once it fall, come, you see it in tension with itself, that it, that it can mean at the same time all humankind, and it can mean a man, or even that man. And once it does that, you see, you, you can't put the, Humpty Dumpty, you can't put the pieces back together again without remembering that there's this tension within the notion of man. And this, the play is very good at performing precisely that tension within the notion of man. That there are times when he seems, this seems to be a play about mankindness. And there are times when, when, when you put Prospero in the frame with Ariel, with Caliban, with Miranda, with, uh, 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 Ferdinand, uh, you see his partialness, and you see his lack of impartiality, you see his interestedness, you see his desires, you see his blindnesses, and so forth. And so that, uh, again, the play is brilliant in the way it emblematizes for us both the wish to have a notion of man, empowered man, man proud man, dressed in his little brief authority, that's Isabella, again, in Measure for Measure, and the idea that man is only actually uh, one of a variety of ways of being a man or a version of mankind. Uh, and uh, so, so, so the humanist reading of the play, so to speak, really begins with this notion of Prospero as all in all and what that means and also looks at his limitations before the play and after the play and also his limitations within the play. And those limitations, far from being a flaw in the character, are what make the character an interesting character rather than just a, an allegorical cutboard, a cardboard figure, cutout figure. Uh, the, we've talked a little bit about the feminist reading in that we have talked about, about what would happen if you focused on the women in the play. Uh, and the autobiographical reading, again, I mentioned a while ago because it's so persistent. This is the Fant there's so many fantasies that attach to the, to the notion of, of, of Shakespeare, including the fact that we can know something about him, that we can know him, that he knows us, that he's scripted us, and the desire to uh, actually have some kind of relationship to Shakespeare. And even, if I can go back to the master-slave for just a second, to have some control over this figure who seems to have some control over us, does play into the way in which this persistent recurrent notion that this play is about Shakespeare's biography, uh, that he had a daughter who married, that he you know, lost a son, that he was getting old, that he left London, that he went back to Stratford, that he shortly died and so forth, that the, the, that there, there, that the, the events of the play foreshadow the events in Shakespeare's life or retell the events in Shakespeare's life. This is again our our cultural desire, I think, to have some, some intimate connection with Shakespeare and even to be his heirs, even to be the survivors of Shakespeare and the inheritors of Shakespeare in this way. There's nothing wrong with these desires. Uh, there's nothing wrong even with this kind of reading. The fact that it's not historically accurate uh, isn't the end of the story because the, the uh, theater is a magic space. And we get out of it partly what we put into it. And so the very persistence of this fantasy or wish or reading or misreading is itself a kind of reading. Is a, it tells us a, a, a kind of story about the power of the play. And again, about, and I want really to keep insisting on this, about the simplicity of the architecture of the play, about the way it is reduced to elementals, the island, the man, the half man, half something else. The one daughter, the king. The, I mean, every there's there, and 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 this mention of the chessboard uh, reminds us that there are other places in which these kind of allegorical roles are mentioned, even within the play. But the the, the immense simplicity and therefore monumentality of this play is partly what makes it so very great and so very powerful. 
Um, I asked Larry and Mel if they would, would be so kind as to introduce a topic into the mix, since we could talk about this play forever. And I think they've been so fabulous within the course that I would like for them to sort of conduct us in a direction. Larry, could you point towards something that you think it would be good for us to talk about? Yeah. Um, well, something that I think about in terms of the production history of this play um, is that it's sort of has, is that is that it's been um, an occasion for spectacle, um, and particularly its sensuous elements. Um, it, it, its translation, for instance, into opera or into ballet, um, have been incredibly suggestive. Um, so I think it would be great, for instance, if we would look at some of the songs in it, or perhaps that mar the marriage mask. Um, but all, all these various theatrical forms that seem to have kind of lent it an incredible durability in production. Absolutely, right. And this goes along with this issue that, that I mentioned very briefly at the beginning of the play about whether Ariel is male or female, whether, whether he or she flies or not. There seems to be a, a really desire to, and Ariel is associated with almost all of these things. He is the entrepreneur of the mask. He is the singer of the songs. Maybe let's look at a couple of the songs to begin with because they're so wonderful. Uh, The, uh, in Act 1, Scene 2, we have two songs from Ferdinand. Uh, and this is the moment that T.S. Eliot was remembering and rewriting in The Wasteland. Uh, uh, can we impose upon you, Larry, to... I copy of the text, but uh, else Okay. <laughs> Are you thinking of Come Unto These Yellow Sands? Yeah, yeah, starting with that, yeah. All right. Well, I won't sing it, but... Um, Come unto these yellow sands and then take hands, curtsied when you have and kissed the wild waves whist, foot it featly here and there, and sweet sprites the burden bear, hark, hark. Bow wow, the watchdogs bark, bow wow, hark, hark, I hear the strain of strutting Chanticleer cry cock a diddle do. All right, so this is the first song that Ferdinand hears. Enter Ferdinand and Ariel Invisible playing and singing. Now this, this kind of stage direction, which sounds like science fiction, is actually fairly common in the period, that if a character is, is, is meant to be, could be wearing a cloak of invisibility, visible to us, not to Ferdinand. Uh, can, can you interpret this song? What does it seem to be talking about? Who's it addressed to? Come into these yellow sands and then take hands. The audience, okay, good. Anybody else? I mean, maybe there is nobody else but the audience. To Ferdinand, to all the party that came with him. Um, come into these yellow sands and then take hands. This is, because it's a, so it's a song and it's an invitation to dance, it is an invitation. It's like a revels moment, you know, the moment at the end of a court mask when the actors and the audience dance together. This is possible in a court mask because the actors on stage, rather than being ordinary people, are themselves noble men and indeed noble women. So it's not a scandal to touch them or to dance with them because they're social equals. So this is in a way, yes, Larry? Say a few words about the court mask um, as a form. You know, what, what it, where, where, oh, where it originates sure. historically, what it means, <clears throat> how, how it's conducted. I'll try, okay. Um, so uh, you'll remember that the public theater emerges uh, as uh, an entertainment which is, relatively speaking, democratic in its interests, that apprentices go to the theater, that uh, noblemen go to the theater, that, that Queen Elizabeth went to the theater, that King James went to the theater, but that it was open access, uh, that there were different levels of, um, of payment, and that it was a kind of a rowdy, the public theater was kind of a rowdy place. Plays put on the daytime, 
uh, uh, different places where you could uh, food sold in the probably in the in the halls and so forth, uh, and that there were all these kind of anti theatrical tracts and writings that sort of talked about the dangers of theater, uh, that theater was danger because it impersonated real life, because it made you fall in love with the actors or actresses, because it made you dissatisfied with your own with your own lot, uh, because it was. Uh, unreligious in that it did, you know, pretend to be images, to, to do what God's supposed to do to make images of man, uh, but also because it was so seductive, and it was seductive even in a very material way, that is to say that uh, apprentices would cut work in order to go to the theater, and that, that, and that, and that it was also a place, and we're still talking here about the public theater, where uh, when there was plague in the city, it was rampant because a lot of people are stuffed together in this, this small space and so forth. So, so uh, this is a kind of performance which is very popular, but, but also very demotic, very interested in the general populace and also a place in which you know, rebellion and revolt might take place. In contradistinction to this, there developed uh, private theaters, indoor theaters, in which, for example, a play like this might be performed. This one is also a, a play that's performed in a public space. Uh, and also court masks, which were extremely popular, especially during the time of King James and uh, 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 James's son, Charles. So we have the Jacobean ma mask and the, the uh, Caroline mask. And, what, what, and, and this is a case in which there's a collaboration between a poet and a, and a, and a, a scene designer. The most famous of these collaborations is between Ben Jonson and Inigo Jones, who is a great scene designer, in which uh, Jonson finally writes a poem called An Expostulation Upon Inigo Jones, in which he complains that the stage effects are taking over, that painting and carpentry are the soul of mask. He's extremely unhappy about his words being eclipsed. But the, the general structure of the court mask is that there is an anti-mask, A-N-T-I mask, which is also an anti-mask, A-N-T-E mask, something that happens before the mask, of something monstrous. Uh, uh, there's a mask of blackness. There's a mask of witches that begins with, with, uh, uh, begins with, with witches and turns into queens. Uh, there's a mask of pygmies. There's some spectacular, you can imagine a mask of Caliban's, you could have plural Caliban's. Some spectacular image of uh, negativity that then gets transformed or converted by a theatrical exfoliation. It's a literal changing of the stage, the wonderful devices in which what looks like a cave turns into a mountain, what looks like a, 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 an enclosed space opens up and so forth. And the characters also, the, the, the negative characters disappear, replaced by positive characters who are signs of virtue. Uh, and, and often these masks are very allegorical and they're figures of harmony of, uh, of, of uh, political success, of uh, pleasure reconciled to virtue is the most famous uh, mask that, that, that Johnson writes. And, and it's about Daedalus and the, ma and, and the maze and, and the idea that, and the choice of Hercules uh, and the idea that pleasure and, and virtue can indeed be reconciled. So in this play, we have a mask at the, which is performed, the wedding mask. Uh, and indeed, this, the, the, the play The Tempest and the play The Winter's Tale uh, were almost surely performed at the weddings uh, at the wedding of James's daughter, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, so here we have a wedding within a wedding and a wedding mask within a play. There's, it is self-performed at a wedding, and itself allegorizes the eternal happiness of the wedded pair, which turned out not to be so happy. But that's another story. Um, and and in this mask, the mask of Juno and Ceres. Uh, Juno, the, the, the goddess of marriage, Ceres, the goddess of the harvest here, uh, combine. Notice that who's not, who, who's the major goddess who's not present in this mask? Sorry? Venus, Venus yes. V no, no Venus, no Aphrodite, no lust. Uh, no lust. Instead, we have the you know, marriage and fertility. Uh, we have the fruits of marriage rather than the run-up to marriage taking place. Uh, and, and nymphs and reapers happening here. So again, it's fertility, it's nature, uh, and it's a mask that's interrupted, you may remember, by what? By, by, by what? Why does he interrupt it? Why does he interrupt it? Yeah. He forgot about the plot that's going on outside there, the plot to murder him, Caliban and the low conspirators, Stefano and Trinculo. My God, we're never going to finish talking about this play. Steph Stefano and Trinculo, 
who have become who who are the the the, the low usurpers. Uh, these are the the butler and the court jester who also came off the ship who used to be servants in the old world. Now in the new world, they're going to be masters. And Stefano is going to be the new suitor to Miranda uh, and bring thee forth brave brood, says Caliban, speaking in this wonder wonderful alliterative language that associates him again with an older English tradition. The Caliban, having failed himself to become the suitor of Miranda, going to hand her over to this god figure, Stefano, the butler, with his magic potion, which is what? Alcohol. Uh, again, you know, if you know anything about how, what, what happened to native populations, this is a kind of poignant moment here. But Caliban basically gets drunk, ban, ban, ca Caliban, liberty, liberty, and so forth. Because this is the opposite kind of song from the transformative songs of, that, that Ariel sings to, to Ferdinand. Um, and so, again, not on the stage with us, but kind of off stage, is this conspiracy against the life of Prospero the very conspiracy that we talked about when we said that, that Ariel has them stuck in this stinking mire. Uh, but Prospero interrupts the mask right in the middle, uh, and everything disappears. And we have that most beautiful speech in all of Shakespeare, our revels now are ended, which is about the revels. It's about the mask. I mean, the word revels here is a technical word that has to do with, I mean, it, we have, you know, revel, the Christmas revels and so forth, uh, with the, the, and, which is not unrelated to the notion of revelation, incidentally. But, this, but we, we have this notion that revel means general playing around and having a festivity, and so it does. But the revels were, was a technical term for what happens at the end of the mask when there's the image of earthly and godly harmony uh, by the actor's who are often the family of the audience, because it's a noble audience, a private audience, dancing with the audience. So that, that and, and again, the image of dancing here from the Elizabethan times to the present, and very poignantly in this play, is the image of earthly and godly harmony. That the, the music of the spheres, again, why can't we hear Ariel? Because we are fallen. Uh, Ferdinand can hear him, uh, but it still seems a little bit strange to him. Uh, so this, the, the dance here at the end of the, re of the, of the marriage uh, uh, mask is meant to be, again, an, 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 an image of earthly harmony uh, modeled on heavenly harmony. And it's the best possible omen for a marriage. But of course, it's interrupted, as it always will be interrupted, because the message of Shakespearean drama is interruption. It's not conclusion. We never get to harmony. You get instead to some kind of realization or revelation or, or perception. And it's often a memory. It's often something you forgot that then comes back as Hamlet's father will come to him and say, you know, uh, th this is to wet thy almost blunted purpose. Remember me. So th this, the, the forgotten memory comes back again. And that memory is the human trait. We know this from Nietzsche. We know this from everybody. The memory is the thing that, that actually makes these characters human. Uh, so that the, the, the mask at the end, which is an entertainment and would have, it would have occupied a lot of stage time and stage space. And every time I've seen it, it's very special. I've seen wonderful versions of this with kind of three foot high characters. There was a fabulous production at the Chicago Stage Company a couple of years ago. It was just amazing. And I had never been enraptured by this mask before. I'd always thought of it as pages I had to get past in order to get back to the text. But, but it can be fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. And then you feel, as Ferdinand and Miranda did, sort of what happened to it? You know, I, I, this is great. We were in the middle of this. How come we're back in the revenge plot? How come we're back precisely in an older mode of drama? An older mode of drama. I had forgot the file of conspiracy against my life. Um, and we're back in that moment of Prospero wanting revenge. And so we're, we, we rolled back not only in terms of atavistic human behavior, but also in terms of the sort of stage history of how certain kinds of plays came to the Elizabethan and Jacobean stage. So the mask is, is always an image of harmony and slightly an image of timelessness. And it's always, again, going to be interrupted by time. Uh, let's just, before we, now we're going to backtrack to the second song of Ferdinand, because I don't want to leave us with only the one, just to read you this one again uh, very shortly after uh, the one that Larry read us. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. 
nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell, ding dong, hark now I hear them, ding dong, bell. So what's this an image of? It's transformation. Yes, that's step two. Transformation of what? Death. Of death. Of death. Yes, we're looking at a dead body underwater. This is an image we're going to see a lot in Shakespeare. You see it in, in Clarence's dream in Richard III. You see it. There are many places in which this, fa this fantasy or this, this imagination of what it's like to be a drowned person surfaces here. But here, again, immediately, you're quite right, it turns into transformation, sea change, to suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. And this, this notion of the sea change could be, again, take, lifted from this play and talked about as the way in which Shakespeare makes metaphor, the sh way in which Shakespeare makes characters, the way in which he, he, he makes, makes, makes drama, that it seems to be natural, but also it's kind of magical. Uh, bear in mind that this is a fiction, that his father is not dead. That, the, that, that we, we are relieved to find the transformation, the dead body is already turning into natural life again, and pearls, uh, so that we have both jewels, coral and, and pearls, and also you know, new creatures. Uh, but also we have ultimately the sense that this is a fictive event, that he has got to, Ferdinand comes to terms with death imaginatively and in the bounded space of a song so that he can begin to think of himself as fatherless and therefore as man, as the king of Naples, as a figure with a future. Uh, and it's, it, he needs to go through this death of the father. This would be to go back to the psychological or psychoanalytic reading. He needs to go through the death of the father imaginatively so as to be able to re-encounter his father alive again at the end of the play as a different person. And in the meantime, to have conducted, as he does, in an extremely elegant as well as arduous way, his courtship of Miranda. Because again, what, what he does is, of course, to take over all the jobs that Caliban had, the carrying of the wood, the being the slave, and so forth. But he is not the slave, he is the servant. And he animates that word servant out of the Petrarchan discourse in which the lover is the servant of the beloved, in which everything he does is at her servant, in which this language of servant and mistress is the completely common language and the completely common practice. And he talks about the fact that the mistress that he serves makes all his trials pleasures. That, that, so that, that he, the purposelessness, so to speak, of the enslavement of Caliban here becomes purposeful uh, and the, the notion of slavery is, uh, is set aside again in, in favor of this notion of the servant. Uh, so, uh, you have more, Larry, that you want us to talk about about the, about the mask? In the I think that was great. <laughs> All right. Mel, please. R really? Because <laughs> you, you know what I'm going to want to talk about. But I, I want to offer the students a chance to chime in, too, though, because it's, in all seriousness, my voice has been pretty forward on the discussion board this week. Um, I've kind of been still stuck back on Antony and Cleopatra, haranguing on that. So shall, should we open it up for, for student okay. questions? Or, okay. Um, because otherwise, I'm going to want to talk about despair, and everyone will leave here all dreary. And we, we right. certainly don't want to leave the tempest on right. that note. Do you, do you, should, we, should we talk a little bit about it? As long as we just don't leave it on that note, I don't want to right. well, send so, everyone so let me, out let of me here. Say we got 10 minutes, okay. and I think we probably need to talk about Prospero's various farewells. I, because I would not want to say farewell to you without taking note of the fact that this is a guy who says goodbye for half the play. That, um, that you know, he's like an old actor, you cannot really get him off the stage, and he begins rehearsing his departure quite early on. Uh, our Rebels Now are Ended, again, a magnificent speech, and we can read it together. What are his other farewells? What, sorry? There's an epilogue. There is an epilogue, absolutely. There's the epilogue, and between that, there's the moment that we talked about before in which he abandons his magic. The ye elves speech in which he drowns his book, in which he, he abandons his magic, that this is another kind of farewell. Uh, he, uh, it's important, I think, that he keeps 
leaving and not leaving, that he keeps articulating his losses, that he, and that, that, that in each of these spheres he says goodbye to art, he says goodbye to magic, he says goodbye to his daughter, he says goodbye to the island, he says goodbye to life. Uh, what doesn't he say goodbye to? He says goodbye to Ariel, go chick, farewell. Caliban is the one thing that he doesn't say goodbye to. This thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. That there, you know, whether or not you see them going off into the, the, the ether together, there's a sense in which the, the, the release is also an act of claiming. That, and, this is, and, and the I acknowledge mine is different from, but also importantly similar to that moment that we looked about before, at before, in which the, the, we hear that the mother said that you were my child and I believe her. That that's a kind of mine, I acknowledge mine moment. This is a very different I acknowledge mine moment. I think we don't fantasize that this is his actual physical child. So how do we understand that moment of Caliban being acknowledged? Acknowledged, such an important word, yes. In what sense? Prospero molded Caliban's character. He taught him things <coughs> that he chose to teach him. Right. And so it, he is very much a creature of Prospero. And he's responsible. He's responsible that, that, that the deformation of Caliban is not a physical deformation, though he's described at some points in this way, but that he is formed and then he is deformed by, by the paternal law, by the first the, the teaching of, of language, the humanization, and then the dehumanization, by the refusal of the courtship, and by the enslavement. And so, yeah. The withdrawal of love, yes, yes, exactly. But, but first he gives it, and then he takes it away. So that the, the Isle of Fools music speech is really a speech about love. I mean, it's a speech about the access to, to identification and to going outside yourself and so forth. And then, then the, because Caliban feels loss, and he doesn't only feel loss of Miranda. He feels a more profound kind of loss. Exactly. It's just heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Absolutely. Um, and, and, I mean, all of these figures encounter loss. But Caliban, in a way, incarnates it. He, uh, he is both one who has lost and one who allegorizes loss and one who cannot be lost because he is uh, in, indissoluble from the Prospero, who is going forward. Yes. Can I jump in a little Please. bit on this point now? Um, I, to me, it's a very powerful thing as well because I'm reading it through the lens of um, Prospero setting himself up a good death. And it's not that that is what the play is trying to function, but it's appropriating all the forms that people used yeah. to use in order to itemize their existence and say goodbye to it and bequeath certain things so that there's a stock taking. You know, yes. as he says, every third thought will be on death. Um, some of you may be familiar with the idea that in the Renaissance, uh, if, if death took people by surprise, this was, a very, this was a terrible thing. And it was not indicative that you were headed toward a good place. So the, they were very obsessed with the idea of getting everything in order, conscience-wise, conscience wise, conscious wise material-wise. And this is, this is sort of the form of what he's doing at the end. And so therefore, it's all the more tragic and heartbreaking that Caliban seems to have no place in his thoughts as re he's ordering what's most important to him as he's getting ready to go to the next realm, whether that's on earth, through death, whatever next imaginative realm is coming for him, Caliban doesn't have any, any place in right. his sense of leave. This is why this production that I saw that left Caliban on the stage, is like the, the, the famous Peter Arno cartoon about the Noah's Ark and the unicorn, you remember? Anybody see this? It's an old New Yorker cartoon in which there, there's a, it's a heart, completely heartbreaking cartoon. You'll, you'll understand what I mean in a second. Uh, huge storm going on, and over in the distance you can see on the horizon is this arc just disappearing. And y here you are on the edge of a piece of, of island landscape, and there's a unicorn looking at... No, exactly, exactly, looking out at the disappearing arc. 
And, you know, wow. So, so it's, but it's that, it's that image of the unpartnered, unique, uh, fabulous, uh, and unsaved figure. And it's the perspective from that look. I mean, again, it's meant to be a cartoon, but actually, you know, philosophy. Um, so, all right, the, 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 let's talk about the epilogue for a second, just one second. Uh, that just to say that it, I mean, like all epilogues, it, it is epia. It comes after the play. Uh, epilogue, speech after something. And that it is a much less powerful piece of poetry in some ways than some of the speeches that Prospero is given within the text. Uh, I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to read the rebel speech, and then I'll let you go till after Christmas. Um, here's the epilogue spoken by Prospero uh, after he has let Ariel go. And remember the struggle that he has to let Ariel go. And if Ariel is imagination and invisibility and creativity and so forth, uh, he drowns his book, he uh, breaks his staff, he, and this is, of course, an echo of Medea the witch in Ovid. Uh, he lets Ariel go, and then he is alone on stage. Exeunt omnes, everybody else leaves. Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have is mine own, which is most faint. Notice that this, the sejour in the middle of the line emphasizes that. The line stops in the middle. Now tis true, I must be here confined by you. Who are you? Audience, okay, confined, as Caliban was confined, here, on the stage, by you, or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got, and pardon the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell. So who's the magician now? Audience. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. So what's being asked for here? Thank you. Gentle breath of yours my sails must fill, or else my project fails which was to please. Again, watch the sejuras here. Watch the, the, the halts in the middle of the sentence. Now I want. Want in what sense? Lack. Might be desire, but it's also lack. Lack and desire at this point in this play are the same. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant. And my ending is despair unless I be relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes we pardon be, let your indulgence let set me free. And here again, a kind of echo of the notion of a religious indulgence is both a high and a low notion. So this is Prospero to the audience. Now I'll take you back uh, to Act Four, Scene One, uh, uh, which is Prospero only to Ferdinand, really. Uh, and again, it's this speech so often taken out of context that we forget that it's actually spoken just to his putative son-in-law. You do look my son, this is Act 4, Scene 1, Line 4, 146. You do look my son in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir, our revels now are ended. So, be cheerful, our revels now are ended. How often do we quote those two lines together? These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant we've just seen, faded, leave not a rack behind, not a wisp of cloud. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. This is the classic passage. It's the middle of the speech. Sir, I am vexed. Bear with my weakness. My old brain is troubled. Be not disturbed with my infirmity. If you be pleased, retire into my cell and there repose. A turn or two I'll walk to still my beating mind. So here we have sublimity returning into drama. We have this passage that speaks more wisely than it knows about endings and about the, the artifice of drama and the way dreams are reality. 
uh, speaks about the ambitions of the theater and about what it can do for us. And then the speech draws right back into the humanity and frailty of the actor and the character and his beating mind. And that beating mind that we saw in Lear on the Heath, uh, that beating mind in which there's a kind of pulse in the mind that is so painful that he's aware of himself thinking, and that's what makes it so intolerable for him. The play will always return, always return into the human from the sublime. There are these glimpses of dream. This, what happens in this speech for us is what happened to the mask and Ferdinand. And we're in the position of speaking to the dismayed and discomfited Prospero and perceiving that what is temporarily at bay here is just an aspect of the same kind of theater that is here represented by the figure with the dismay and the walking into the cell and the beating mind. And it's that frailty in him that is finally the most recognizable aspect of the play. <laughs> Our little life is ended with a sleep. <laughs> I'll see you on the 2nd of January. Have a great holiday.